Dr. Helene Marshall, if you'll just allow me one second here, just switching around. So Dr. Helene Marshall is a professor of education and director of language education programs at LIU Hudson, New York, USA. She teaches courses in linguistics and multicultural education in face-to-face, -face, blended and synchronous online formats. Her research interests include culturally responsive sustaining education, SLIFE, students with limited or interrupted formal education, non-traditional teaching of grammar and instructional technology, especially flipped learning. She has published articles in ELT Journal and TESOL Journal, among others. Her most recent book published with the University of Michigan Press is Meeting the Needs of SLIFE, a Guide for Educators, second edition, co-authored with Andrea de Capua and Frank L. Tang. Uh, Dr. Marshall has developed a model of online flipped learning and her most recent article on that topic is fostering teaching presence through the synchronous online flipped learning approach. And that is published in TESOL um, Educational Journal and co-authored with, I believe, Ilka Kostka. I'm hoping I'm saying that correctly. That's it. So thank you and welcome back, um, Dr. Marshall. Um, I, will, I, I will just pass it over to you. Okay, great. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to be busy and active, but we have a lot of help, backstage help, front stage help, okay? The first task you have is if you could please go to the Google folder and have that folder somewhere where you can access it. Everything we're gonna use is in our folder, okay? So we can put individual links as we go, but it's really easier if you can access everything. The folder has links. The first place to go in the folder is the agenda for today, which I'm going to share with you now. So I'm going to show you our agenda. Our agenda, if I can get it right away. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. And if you can see, we're going to start with a sign-in activity. And then we're going to do a whole group activity where we're going to uh, go through a basic review, very quick review of videos two and three for those people who haven't seen them, very quick, because many of you have. But I don't want people who weren't here last time to be totally in the dark. Then we're going to do an analysis of Martha's absence chart, not as ICF, but as MALP. And you'll see how ICF leads to MALP. So today we're going to talk all MALP all the time. All right. After we do that analysis, you're going to go into quick breakout, breakout groups, and you're going to be analyzing another activity that is a MALP project called Crossing the Mekong. Then you're going to come back out and you're going to show us your work. You're going to be filling out the MALP checklist. And then I'm going to preview with you the videos four and five on uh, other topics that you're going to see related to MALP. And then I'll talk to you about how we're going to follow up with each other, um, watching those videos, but also three optional tasks. And then we'll end with a reflection. And I'll say that everyone who stays today will get a secret code to a major discount, a big discount on my books. So we have a wonderful arrangement with my, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, I have a, a wonderful arrangement with my publisher just for, for, you, for you guys, for the membership, okay? Uh, so we're gonna to get to that at the very end. So that's our agenda. Are we all set? Are we ready? Are we pumped up to go? Okay, so I see we have 23 people here at the moment. If you could all please go to reactions. Do you know where reactions is? So if you look where at the bottom of your Zoom uh, box, your Zoom dialogue there, you'll see everything where it says uh, your microphone, your video, participants chat. And if you go to farther to the right, you should see reactions. So under reactions, if you could please indicate with a green check, which is one of the reactions, could you put a green check if you were here, if you were here on the 8th? There's, there's, it doesn't matter either way, I just need to know. A green check, a green check 
if you were here on the 8th of April, I need to see how many of you were here. Okay. Some of you are also putting the green check. It looks like some of you have a green check in your participants. Okay, great. All right. So we had, it looks as though I'm ballparking this. It looks as though we have quite a few student, student, I shouldn't say student, <laughs> quite a few participants. I teach, you know, forgive me, the semester just ended. Uh, we have quite a few participants who were not here on the 8th. And I, I need to tell you, um, not that you won't learn a lot today, but I have created building blocks. And so the first building block was video number one, the intercultural communication framework. That's the basis of everything. That's before we get to the classroom. And then the second building block was cultural dissonance. And that was video number two. And then the third building block was video number three on mouth itself. So that's where we are now. We've done the first three. We haven't discussed videos two and three because that was in between the eighth and now. So I want people who are brand new to get in their kind of mindset where we are in this training. So I encourage you, I want you to stay, absolutely. But if you feel a little bit lost, it's possibly if you have not seen the first three play posits, okay? because this is a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. This is wraparound PD. This is not one-stop shop, sit and get. I'm doing a training here, okay? But it will be long lasting because those videos are your video course. Those five videos are yours. You can watch them as many times as you want. So if you haven't seen the first three, fine. You can see them later. If you saw the, the two for today, but not the first one or whatever combination. The, the other videos, four and five, are the ones you are going to see after today, and I'm going to prepare you for those, okay? So just to get a quick overview of where we've been and where we're going. Okay. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat, and then I would need a little help with someone telling me when there is a question. Just interrupt me if it's an I'll do that, Helene. Question. It's Carrie. You need I'll to do that. You need to inter interrupt me because I am looking at 10 things in front of me on several monitors and the chat is difficult for me to add to that list of things I'm working on here. Okay, so um, if you looked at, again at the agenda, the first thing is your sign-in activity. So your sign-in uh, is going to be on the Jamboard and the Jamboard is in the folder. So you're gonna go to your folder and that's a link to the Jamboard. A direct link I just put in the chat. So please go to our sign in activity and very quickly, this is just real quick. What I'm interested in is what change you can make in your classroom based on your understanding of MELP. So this is people who did watch video number three. Okay. So just put in the sign in. If you did not, you just don't have to do that. Or if you've read about MELP or know about it from some other source, that's fine too. I just need one thing from each of you. What's a change you can make in your classroom? Not in the chat, not in the chat, but on Sorry, the Sorry, Helene, we have, we have view only access. We can't add post-its to your gym. Okay, all right. I, I thought that you were in, if you were in the uh, folder, it says, okay. I thought if you were in the folder, you could automatically edit. I'm learning yeah, myself. It's, uh, I'm learning it's giving myself. us a bit of grief. Yep, no problem. I, no, it's okay. When I add a new, when I add a new document, um, in the folder, it doesn't automatically give you edit access to it. So I see that now. All right. So now you have the edit access and you can put your sign in. Thank you very much for telling me. I need to know right away. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Like I said, I'm not looking at the chat because I have other things. Just tell me. Okay. So while you're signing in, everybody sign in and um, you can put your name, your first name if you want, because then you Remember, you all kind of relate to each other, work together over the year, you're members of the same organization. So it's helpful for you to know what each other is thinking about mouth because they can follow up that way. So take your post-it. If you're first time on Jamboard, you go to the fourth icon on the left, pick a sticky note of whatever color you like. You can move it around, you can make it bigger, uh, whatever you want. But this is a little collaborative activity so that 
people who aren't as familiar with MALP can get the gist of it by looking at the people's takeaways who did look at the MALP material. Uh, if the Jamboard fills up, I have another page ready to go. So I see there are 25 people on the Jamboard. So if it jams up, haha, uh, go to page two. Page two is just as good as page one, they're, they're the same. So please do that. And now I'm going to, while you're working on your sign-in, uh, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen to show you, make sure everyone sees what we're looking at. We're looking at this sign-in here. In case some of you are unfamiliar, you see how people are posting there. See that, how that works? I know there's always someone who's never used Jamboard, which is fine, you're gonna learn it. Um, it's better than the Zoom whiteboard. It's just a little more versatile and you can have a little more fun with it. And, um, and also it's permanent, it's there for you in your folder, okay? So in the interest of time, which I hope I don't have to say too many times because you know it is short, uh, I am gonna move on while this is happening and uh, we might take a look at these later uh, to see as a composite what people have gotten out of MELP. But now what I'm going to do is review, as I said, I'm going to review quickly because I see a lot of people are here for the first time and you're discovering all of this for the first time. So I do want to, I'm just going to pin myself. So I assume that's it. Okay, great. All right. Um, so this is MALP. Now this is a, is a, a presentation that is a PDF in your Google folder. So you have it. You don't need to be taking notes and wondering on which slide or this or that. You have it. It's already uploaded. It's already in your folder. Some of you who have multiple screens might want to have your own screen going. You're perfectly welcome to do that. Okay. So we're talking here about um, equity for students with limited or interrupted formal education, sometimes called SLIFE, sometimes called less learners, whatever you call them, we know who they are, all right? And many of you work with them and you know them very well. What I'm trying to do is take what you already know and package it and frame it so that you can turn key what you know in a, in a manageable way for people who aren't as familiar. I looked at a lot of your comments. I read through all the PlayPosit discussions and comments, and I hear you. I hear what a lot of you are saying. Um, many of you are talking about how, yes, you know, um, but how does it actually work? What actually happens in the classroom? That's more what we're gonna do today. Um, and many of you said that you, although you did know, these characteristics of these learners that this framed it for you in a way that you could explain it to other people. And so both of those are my goals. The theory piece, which is to frame it, and the practice peach piece, peach, that's good, I like peaches, okay, which is to make it happen in your class. And there are two ways to do that. We're gonna talk about that. There are two ways to implement MALP. Okay, so now um, let's see what we've got here. So this is pretty quick. So this will be in the chat. Which cultural difference? Very quick, I'm gonna do these. There are three cultural differences, we're reviewing them. So those of you who know, and there are plenty of you who do, which one is this? Put it in the chat for those we're trying to bring along people because I don't want them to get lost today. So please tell me which one this is referring to. Which of the three cultural differences am I referring to with these pictures that I'm showing you. Which of the three? You're doing this for your fellow participants. I know you know if you've been doing the work. Which one is this? Okay, thank you, Barbara and Lisa. Okay, so this refers to the two-dimensional world versus the three-dimensional world, orality versus literacy, oral transmission versus the written word as central to learning. That's number one, all right? Number one, and all of this is covered already. We've done it, it's in the video, okay? 
Um, oh, darn, I didn't know the headings were going to come up there. Sorry, answer given. <laughs> Funny. Okay, these two pictures, which difference is that? <laughs> I meant to have only the pictures. Okay, so obviously the second one, you can still put it in the chat because when we save the chat, it's good to have it. So please write it in there anyway. So what is, I hope you're laughing. Barbara's laughing. Okay. Collectivism versus individualism is our second big cultural difference. Again, it's discussed at length in the videos, okay? 70% um, of the world's cultures are collectivistic. Most of our students are from collectivistic cultures. Some of you may be also, but the general, the general North American mindset is individualist, whether you think so or not, the literature tells us that. And the third, again, I meant to have only the pictures. I don't know how that happened. Okay. So the third difference, again, it's not a guessing game anymore. That's okay. So this is the third one. Informal versus, versus formal ways of learning. And you see the pictures tell the tale. Okay. So these pictures remind you of the three differences. Okay. Those are the three underlying differences that MALP is based on. Okay. So this is a review. All right. So you remember these three and here they are. Orality versus literacy, collectivism versus individualism, informal ways of learning versus formal education. All right. So we know this. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? And this is just for the people who haven't participated. I just want to give you an example of the third difference, because the third difference is something that you may not be as familiar with. So if you give some student, I know many of you have seen this. But if you have give a student one of questions such as a multiple choice, which is a classification task, and you ask them which one does not belong, although this task for us would say that three of the objects are just throw it in, throw it in the chat for me, those of you who know, just throw it in. Um, what is what are they? They're tools. Barbara's on top. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's my Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Okay. Anyway. You've got to get rid of a log because they're tools. Well, none of your slife will do that. I mean, they may uh, if they've been you know, explicitly taught, but that's the point. In MALP, you have to teach them, this is this crazy way we think. We actually test people on saying three or tools get rid of the log, which is a meaningless way of thinking in the real world because nobody does that in the real world. They don't collect a bunch of tools and get rid of the log. They, what are they going to do in the real world? Okay. That encapsulates probably the most difficult piece of MALP that you need in order to go forward. That's why I'm reinforcing that one, okay? So now I'd like to show you how MALP is positioned in the overall, now this is new, overall context of your educational system. So if we look at learning with the affective and cognitive domain, and on the left, I have abbreviated because that's not the area that I'm focused on, the affective domain, it includes many, many things that are important, cell, Maslow, trauma-informed instruction. On the right, we have the cognitive domain with two areas, language and content. And if you look below, you can see what we need to focus on. And there's more, you could add more. I'm trying to do a very broad-based graphic organizer because what I'm gonna do on the next slide is put in MALP. So I'm gonna show you where MALP goes. So what's important to understand about MALP is that it's a building block. It's not the whole ball of wax. So you're not take, getting rid of everything and doing MALP instead. Please do not think that. You're doing everything you're doing, but you're gonna put a little MALP into it, punch it up with MALP. That's what I'm asking you to do. So where does MALP go? Where are we gonna find MALP? And here is where we find it. You might want to think ahead and predict where you think it's going to pop up. Okay, do you see where I put it? So we do have some of it on the affective side and some on the cognitive side. This is a good takeaway slide for you to understand very globally before we do actual projects where MALP fits. So you can look here on the left, what we take from the affective domain would be the cultural conditions for learning. What do these students need in order to be able to learn? Because it might be different from what you need and I need and your other students need, which it is. And the cultural processes. They have ways of learning cultural processes that they expect to happen 
And if those don't happen, they're going to feel ill-equipped. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick example because I know some of you weren't at in the video. I asked you how you would feel if there would be no visuals and no recording of my voice and no way to access any information except me talking right now. And many of you answered you would feel naked, frustrated, uh, angry, I mean, everything. You didn't like it. Where's my pen? And oh, I forgot to say, you can't take notes. No notes. You just have to sit there and listen. Well, that would be horrifying for many of you. How are you going to remember anything? Not for your students. It's the opposite for your students. Oh, I don't have to, I don't have to write anything. I, I don't have to look at anything. I can just listen to this person give me this wonderful information and it's going to go right into my head and I think of it as a story and I have it. They have a very different way of processing. Okay. So again, you cannot make assumptions. We're talking about a very different worldview now, which brings us to schooling. So on the cognitive side, we don't have two, we don't have language and content. We have three. We have language, content, and U.S. schooling. Now, for all of your learners who are coming here, immigrants, refugees, or even if they are indigenous populations who have not participated in the system, it's the same thing. They're not used to the system. And so what we have to do is we have to help them get used to our system. Now, if they come from someone else's formal education, let's say, I'm just gonna take because some of my friends are from Japan. I was just talking with them last night and they may come here, they might feel as though they're very well educated and they shouldn't have any trouble. Well, they have much less trouble because they're just going a crosswalk. Oh, in Japan, we do this, but in America, or I'm sorry, North America, we do this. So I think it's important to say that what we're talking about today is not that. We're not talking about making a crosswalk. Oh, different kind of system. One system, another system. We're talking about not having participated in any type of formal education or very little formal education. Okay. And we break it down into two, the academic ways of thinking and the decontextualized tasks which we go into in great detail again on the videos, okay? But if you wanna break it down, those are the two biggies that we need to teach. And we need to focus on teaching that. That's the other part of what we teach. So you see how math is a component of what you're doing. You keep doing, but you infuse it with math. So on the left is about including the conditions and processes. And on the right, it's about explicitly adding projects that focus on these areas that others may not need. Okay, so now I wanna see if you can do a guessing game with me really quick. Okay, we're gonna fill in the blanks. So what do you think goes in these blanks? Look at the bottom. This is, a, again, this is a review to make sure you, you're clear and you should by what I just said, even if you haven't participated before, see if you can guess how to fill in this chart. You might wanna take pen and paper and see if you can fill it in yourself. See if you can fill it in. So conditions, what would be the conditions? What would, sorry, what would be the conditions for slide? What would they be? Oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna start from the bottom. Okay, so what would be the activities? We just said decontextualized tasks based on academic ways of thinking. What would be on the left side? What's the opposite of that? Instead of decontextualized, right? Decontextualized, instead of academic ways of thinking, what is it that they expect as an activity to learn? See what you, if you can pick it. This is a quick thing, so we're not doing it interactively, but if you could put it in the chat, that would be wonderful. You know, in longer trainings, there are all kinds of things. I give people envelopes and we walk around the room. It's a whole different thing, but we're doing it this way and that works too. Okay, good. So if you got it, that's great. I see a lot of you know. All right, what are we doing for the processes? So we're gonna look first at their process, which would be oral transmission. And what do we put on our side? What are we gonna put on our side? Instead of oral transmission, what goes on the right? Written word. And the other process that they like to use besides oral, which we've talked about already, what is another process? 
How do they like to learn? They like to share responsibility. And what do we count on? What is our bottom line? We do cooperative learning, but ultimately, if you have to be tested, those gatekeeping devices, every gatekeeping device demands something of you. What does it demand? Who knows what that is? Yeah, that's when the pedal meets the metal or whatever metaphor, okay? So that's what, what they have to master. And if, if you look at the three things on the right, right now, that's standardized testing. So if we're talking about college and career readiness or anything, vocational programs, anybody, they need those three or they're not going to do well, regardless of how strong their English might be and how much they know of the content. It's this that's neglected. That's the whole point of mouth is that we need to focus here. That's your test prep. That's your test prep, this on the right. So what we're gonna do is we'll see in a minute. Now let's look at the conditions. So they want the interconnectedness because they're collectivistic. And what do we demand of them? From the time they grab your leg when they're five years old and they come over and snuggle with you. And then the time they're at their dissertation, their doctorate, what are they doing? They're all by themselves. Independence is our goal. That's not their goal. Their goal is to remain interconnected. I have a student of mine from 30 years ago and she and I are still connected all this time. She won't let me go. <laughs> she keeps asking me to do things with her. Okay, it's great, I love her, okay. Um, they demand immediate relevance. And you might say, well, everybody likes that. No, 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 it's not about what they like, it's about what they need. If they don't see anything immediate in what you're doing for them, their, their focus is lost, their motivation is lost, okay? So you have to find a hook. It doesn't have to be everything. You have to find a hook. And of course, we're all about the future. And they might say, oh yes, I care about my future. I wanna be a doctor someday. But they have, they're not really thinking of all the many, 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 many oops and steps it'll take to get them there. All right, so this is important. And the reason I spent time is that this will be your checklist. You will see how this is MALP and this is your checklist. So what we do in MALP is we accept the conditions for learning. So everything you do with MALP is gonna have immediate relevance and interconnectedness. We combine the processes. So we honor, that's why it's a sustaining model, not just a responsive model. We honor their processes, but we gradually include more and more individual accountability and written word, not only in high stakes activities, but in low stakes. It's important not to bait and switch. So we have to get them used to these things on the right, okay? Not the conditions, but the processes. They need to learn those processes all through. So we do back and forth and back and forth. You'll see that in the projects when I show you. And last, we're gonna focus on decontextualized tasks and academic ways of thinking. That's our curriculum. You wanna know what the curriculum of MALP is? It's this. What are decontextualized tasks? Well, you know them like the back of your hand, true, false, matching, multiple choice, see, you know, every, all those kinds of activities that you ask people to do to demonstrate how they can think academically. And then the academic ways would be all of Bloom, Bloom's taxonomy and cause and effect and compare and contrast and classify, analyze, assert, substantiate, you know them all, okay? But that's all in school we do that. You may do it in the real world intuitively, but not explicitly and not tied to decontextualized tasks. That's the key. If you get that, you get the key. And what does that look like? This is important because it shows you what I mean by familiar language and content. So the idea of mouth is not only do you teach these things explicitly and separately, but you use their cultural you use their background, what they know in terms of language, in terms of information, all of that comes from their background, their culture. So what does it look like to use familiar language and content, right? So you don't wanna use brand new, difficult academic English or, ac or academic subject areas when you're doing a brand new lesson on the Venn diagram. You want the Venn diagram lesson to be used with familiar language and content. One thing, once they get what a Venn diagram is, then they can use it all they want. La, la, Venn, 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 okay? But the first time we're doing home language or dialect, this is where my bilingual educators get excited, yes. Or 
English at the independent level. So in other words, not new, 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 new English, okay? Something that they kind of can hang their hat on. The familiar content is gonna be the proverbial funds of knowledge, a la mole and others, okay? And then it's gonna be previously mastered subject matter. So if you've already taught them something, you might say, but I've already taught it. Yes, that's the whole point. That's why we're gonna use it for a MALP project because the MALP project is gonna show that how they can take that content that they already know and plug it into an academic way of thinking and decontextualize tasks. If you understand up to this point, you've got MALP. Got MALP? <laughs> okay, so it's 3.30, which is halfway. So now we're going to go into, the rest of it is projects. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna look at a project together. And then I'm gonna give you just a very few minutes to do a project by yourselves um, in breakouts. And then we're gonna come back and you're gonna show me how it went for you, okay? So this is Martha's absence chart. And I did ask you to um, analyze the chart as in ICF. And someone did a lovely job of that. And we're not going to discuss it except to say that ICF is the foundation of MALP. So very briefly, ICF has to do with establishing relationships, identifying priorities and accommodating them when you can, and making the unfamiliar familiar by making associations for the student. And so this is what Martha did. And this is a follow-up to Karen's uh, thoughts and feelings, which I'm not going to go back to at this point but they both deal with being absent. So the issue was being absent. So everyone's familiar with that, right? We all know what being absent is about, that you have to come to every single class. And when you're absent, it's a big deal for us, okay? It's not such a big deal for students. They come when they can. If they feel like they can't or they don't feel well that day, they might not come. It's a different set of priorities. But if we have a good relationship with them, we can talk with them about these difficult issues. And so that's what Karen was doing. And she had a protocol for that. And if you're interested and you haven't read that material, it's in the folder from April 8th. But now I'm moving on to look at Martha through the MALP lens instead of the ICF lens, okay? So this is actually a MALP project. And you might say, it's not a project, it's just a chart. But that's the point. MALP can just be a chart. So this chart on the wall was maintained over the whole course of the course, you know, say for 15 weeks or 20 or whatever, how many or all year. And every time someone was absent, this is the whole class. Martha's the teacher. It said so underneath. Martha was the teacher. It's not the student. This is the whole class. So Martha, the teacher, wrote, I was absent because. And every time a student was absent, they had to come in and on a card, they had to put on a red card the yellow card or the green card. You, by the way, listen, because then you're gonna help me fill out the MALP checklist. So you're listening for all the things about MALP while I talk. Okay, so they fill out, they fill out the card. How do they know what card to fill out? Well, they tell the class, this is why they were absent. And the class talks, maybe it's pairs or groups, or maybe they just shout it out, you know, you're the teacher. But anyway, they come to a consensus of what color it should be. And either the student or the teacher or a friend, it gets written up one way or another on the card. And the student already knows what it says because it's their reason. So if they're not the one that actually wrote it, they dictated it, oral to written, don't give it away. Okay, now, uh, so over time, you end up with columns. So you see the left column is, sorry, we don't, Recognize that as a valid, okay. And then yellow is, well, maybe it depends. Let's know more about it. And then green is, sure, we get it, we get it, we get it, okay. And so also this can lead to vocabulary. You can see an idiom there on the right, I threw up, doesn't mean throw the ball up. You know, there's, there's all kinds of language opportunities to exploit, but that's not our focus. Our focus is not the language and not the content. What is our focus? Well, you might say, well, the focus is having them learn what, what's acceptable. Well, okay, that's the content. That's the content of it is learning 
in our society, how we view absence. And that, that's something important for MALP too, because that's something they need to know on a day-to-day -day basis. But what is the big benefit from a MALP perspective in the end? What are we teaching them? Look at the red column, the yellow column, and the green column. So we are actually teaching them something. Put in the chat what it is we're teaching them. What are we teaching them? Put in the chat, what is it that we are teaching that is part of formal schooling that we are teaching? Okay, and then I need you to go to the Google folder because in the folder we have, I'm gonna to go to the folder um, and we have, in the folder, we have the, the checklist. So now we're gonna do this together. So you have to tell me, if you want to, you can go to the checklist, we can fill this out together. So you're looking at the chart. The chart is also in the, in the folder. So you can look at the chart, but you might not even need to look at the chart because you understand basically what the chart was. But if you come to this page, and again, I'm going to check to make sure that you can write, although I, it, it's really more about me because I'm not sure we can have so many people. We have a lot of people here to actually, ah, there it is again, change. Let me change it so you can edit. All right. So this is, so if you think you know, uh, you can go in here. I see nine people are there, 10 people are there. So we're going to do the, che the checklist for Martha's absence chart. All right, how is this project relevant to the students' lives? This is not hard to do. I'm doing it with an easy one that's not, this is kind of your very basic to teach. I'm trying to teach you the checklist by using something very basic and simple, okay? And then we're going to do something a little more complicated. All right, so let's take a look very quickly at the checklist. So what can you put here? How is it relevant? If anyone has an idea, you can put it down. And for connect interconnectedness, how is how did they get more interconnected? Um, if you're looking, by the way, there, there is the document is there, a picture of Martha's chart. You can open it up anytime you want. It's also in the folder. So someone says, I wanted to see my dad's friend. I was at the pizza place. So how, did, you know, there we go, interconnectedness. Do you see that? Um, immediate relevance, well, they need to, you know, they're talking about themselves and being absent. They're, you know, my stomach was hurting. That's pretty relevant. I had a headache. Okay. So do you see how you fill in the conditions for learning? All right. You've got them. They're interested. So remember, this is to get them beginning to learn. They need those conditions. So we've met them and keep, keep typing, keep filling it in. You're doing a great job. I see 13 people here. How does it incorporate shared and individual? You see shared and individual here. And remember, this, this is all the students in the class. This is not one student. So every student adds to it, see? So how do you see both shared and individual here? Who sees that? Just go ahead and type it in anytime. Doesn't matter who, there's not individual accountability here for you guys. I just wanna get it filled out, okay? So put in how they're both sharing responsibility and yet they're individually accountable in this project, okay? And then how is the written word being scaffold, like scaffold dead through oral interaction? I kind of alluded to that actually, you know, if you, when you heard me talking about it, I kind of mentioned something about that. So this is obviously the written word. How is it scaffold through oral interaction? Okay, so think about that. And then academic ways of thinking using familiar language and content. So the, how is that happening? How, how is this academic ways of thinking? What kind of thinking do they have to do in order to do this chart? And in what way is the language and content familiar to them? So fill that out. See if you can see what kind of academic, don't just put academic, what, what type of thinking do they have to do? And there are several ways you can look at this. It's, a, it's not just one answer, but there's several types of academic thinking they actually have to do, even for this very basic, looks to us, basic task. Think about what they need to do. So fill that in. 
And then at the end, what about a decontextualized? How is this decontextualized? What about it is decontextualized? What task are they learning that is a decontextualized task? Remember what I said about if you look at it vertically, what you notice? What do you see there? What are we actually doing here? What are we creating? And how is that decontextualized? So this isn't, this is all these pieces from all these different days and all these different students. And we've got it on this one blah, blah, blah. What is it? What are we creating? What have we made together? What have they learned? This is the classification is great, but that's the academic thinking. What I need is the decontextualized. What is what, what are we making in order to show that we can classify? What have we created here? What if I made lines, vertical lines? What do we have? What did we make? What is this? It even says so on, on the directions of what this is. Martha's absence, remember what it is? Yeah, it's a graphic organizer, but we can be even more specific. Well, it isn't quite a T-chart, but that's good. T-charts would work for this. That's, that's that decontextualized. Okay, you could say that it's it's columns, right? So it's almost like a table, isn't it? Almost. Now the rows don't line up, but at least they're learning columns. They've got three columns. So you can teach column, column, and you could give them names like the no column, the maybe column, the yes column. So they're learning what columns are. That's a very valuable concept. They don't have that concept. They, things could be anywhere in front of them. Now we're showing them, oh, columns, okay? All right, and you're doing great with putting things in the, I just wanted to correct that one because that was tough. That's not so easy to just separate what's the academic thinking and what's the actual decontextualized task that demonstrates that you have that type of thinking, okay? So do you see how you fill out the chart? You're doing great with it, okay? So uh, I'm looking at the clock. I can't believe I've been talking as fast as I can. And uh, it's just very, very short. I hope you guys understand how difficult it is to pack something meaningful into one hour when it's, uh, I really want you to understand it. I need you to understand it, okay? So um, this is being recorded and you can slow me down if I'm too fast, but I need to move on. So you have this checklist, which is the group checklist. And you can keep working on it as a group. And if you notice, I'm kind of demonstrating some of MALP with you because you are collaboratively filling out this chart. Now, um, what I wanna show you is another project. So the, what, what we call this, I'm going to uh, make a new share now, and I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm gonna say that Martha's absence chart is called a class survey project. Now, a class survey project is what I call the quintessential MALP project. If you do no, and, but, but don't just say, oh, what did Helene say? She, oh, she says do surveys. Well, okay. So the survey is the quintessential or prototypical MALP project. If you do class surveys, and there are hundreds of ways to do them, your teachers, you can figure out a million ways. I've had students create them. I've had myself create all kinds of ways you can do surveys. But the class survey has all the elements of MALP built right into it. It's a no-brainer MALP project. And there are tons of other MALP projects, but I like to start with the survey because it's, it's intuitive for you. And you can do it on any topic at all. So this was the first one I ever did. So I, it's my favorite. So this is crossing the Mekong River. Now, these are students that really uh, literacy is brand new for them, both in English and their native language. These were Hmong. And um, people say, oh, but I don't work with Hmong. That's not the point, is it? Right, okay, we know what the point is. The point is whoever you have, whatever population you have, they have cultural backgrounds. Find out about their cultural backgrounds. Okay, and if you have a mix, you can have surveys that crisscross the different activities from the different cultures, okay? So they interview at home to get their answers. That's the first language. Think about the MALP checklist. Think about the checklist because we won't have time for the breakouts. I, it's just, it, it, it's short, okay? So uh, instead of the breakout, I want you to work with me on the chat. And when you see an element of MALP, say so. Okay, they interview at home in the native language. What information are they gathering? Well, take a look at this. This was the chalkboard. This is the teacher writing on the chalkboard and the students got the information. 
Laos, they know the flags, and Thailand, there's the Mekong River. They had to cross it. There are their names on the left and on the right are the dates and in the middle is how they cross. So they find out at home their information. They bring the data to class. Oh, I rode a raft 1987. If they don't know rode a raft, it's the picture. Use the picture and then rode a raft. And don't talk about, oh, past tense, irregular verbs. Remember, we're not doing that. We're doing the cultural relevant experience for the students. If something is meaningful to them, regardless of whether they've mastered all, everything up until then syntactically, they will learn this because it's to their heart. Think about the New Zealand Maori, Sylvia Ashton Warner. That's all I need to say. Okay, next, after they share the data, they're the drawing of the maps and the flags. Okay, maybe they go two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional to two-dimensional. This is part of that. You're showing them, oh, that's the flag. Is it really the flag? No, but they already know it's the flag. So you're helping them make that transition to two dimensions, okay? And they, they, they know the map. They don't know how to read a map, but they know this map. They know they went from Laos to Thailand and there was a river in between. You're teaching them about maps. I get excited because this is such powerful stuff. Okay, they add this information. What's the information? Three things, their name, how they crossed, and the date. That's it. That's all they gotta know. They add the information. Then there's a sentence frame. Where are my ESL people? You, you're all ESL people. Make your sentence frame. It's a basic frame. The subject is the name, the verb phrase is, Road, swam, pull, was pulled, and I know it's passive, doesn't matter. If they were pulled, they, do, they learned was pulled. It's a chunk, it's a chunk, that's fine. Okay, now, across the Mekong, everybody says, that's the prepositional, well, prepositional phrase for where, and then the time prepositional phrase in, and then the date, and they learn the numbers. They learn how to say dates, but they each know their own date. They each know their own, but now they're seeing everybody else's, and everyone has the same sentence to make. Notice that, okay? So each one has their own sentence, right? It's sort of like an LEA, you've done that. But notice how it's organized. Is it organized academically? How is it organized? What do we do when we organize? We organize alphabetically, chronologically, right? So the names are not alphabetical and the dates are not chronological. What's important to them? And we're getting back to ICF. What's important to them, and by the way, with ICF, underneath this, you can see you're building relationships, you're getting into priorities, and you're helping them make associations between unfamiliar and familiar. They're learning the maps, the two-dimensional stuff. Now, it's organized by how they crossed, because that's what's important to them, how they crossed. They don't really care about the date at all, and their name, like, okay, that's my name, so what? Why would, I, why would it be alphabetical? Who cares? Why should one be before another? So this is stuff you can teach. This is a perfect way. You can teach chronological order. You can teach alphabetic order. It's, it's just a, a, a mass of wonderful things to exploit. You don't want to milk it too much, but you could. <laughs> okay, so you can ask, respond to questions. And in, in live workshops with longer <laughs> time frames, I have teachers come up with lesson plans. And I put them in breakouts and I say, come up with a mouth lesson plan that makes sense for this project. And I was hoping, you know, you could fill in the checklist and come up with ideas, what you would do with it, what you would teach. And it's a great activity and I encourage you uh, as a follow-up to this workshop that you do that. And I have given uh, uh, you a folder with blank checklists, four blank checklists for group one, two, three, four. So you can do the crossing the Mekong and analyze it and come up with a lesson plan and you can follow up and I'll be around. I don't just fly away uh, at four o'clock, although I have a meeting, but I mean, I, I'm around. <laughs> I'm very happy to help you. I'm Part of what I do is the follow-up here. I'm with you guys. I'm with you. Don't think not. I really am, because I care about you guys. I really do, okay? I've been reading your play posit comments, and I feel connected to you, those of you who have been kind enough to leave me feedback at the end of the play posits. You know, I look at the end, to see what you said about each video and it helps me improve. Some of you don't go to the end. You have to go all the way to the end to get feedback. Now, what did I just do? Take a look. Think about Martha's absence chart. What is this? Look at it, put it in the chat. 
What did I just do? A whole bunch of meaningless lines? What can you teach? What can we create? What is this? What is it? What is it? Take a look. What have we made here? What can we teach? That's so important for them to learn in all their subjects. I'm looking at the chat and I'm waiting for people to tell me. It's not just a grid, it's a grid, yeah, it's a grid, but it's not just a grid. Okay, you could use it for geography, for maps. Yeah, you could do latitude, longitude, you know, whatever, not quite. But it's basically rows and columns. So you could actually number and letter, you could do rows and columns and you can have them analyze the data and they'll be analyzing data. Row three, column three, co which, which column has the preposition or has the, the way you cross? or which column, you know, I mean, you can do tons and tons of easy all the way to hard. You could get, just go to town. And all this is, is very basic information that we collected. So you see how a MALP project, some people say, oh, but it's a project. I don't have time for a project. I have to cover this and cover that. And they barely know the language and I have to do literacy and I have too much to do. Hey, 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 if you don't do this, they will fail and I hate to use the word, but I've seen it too often, they will fail on gatekeeping devices that we use to keep people you know, in or out of being successful in our society. And if you ever really wanna do test prep, you'll do this, you'll do this, because if you do this kind of work with them, decontextualized tests, this is now decontextualized. This is their lives, but we've got it on a, on a table. We've turned their lives into a table. And you see how they have shared responsibility because they each individually brought their story, but together they shared to make a table. You can't have a table with one row and one column. That's not a table, right? So look, they did it together, but they each had to contribute, right? And so we've got that and they're becoming more interconnected because if, oh, I crossed on a raft too. What happened to you? What happened to me? And of course, then you get into the trauma and all of that business and it's true. And some of them may or may not feel comfortable and we know that. But what I'm trying to illustrate is the piece where you use familiar language and content and something that resonates with them is immediately relevant to them and interconnected for them. Okay, that's really, really where mouth the heart of MALP is get those conditions and processes. The oral to written is pretty straightforwardly obvious. So we don't, that one's the easier one to, to glean because of course they're dictating the information and then they're reading it back because they see it and they know what it was already. It's an LEA kind of thing. And this is their artwork. So we're actually taking it from their culture. If you look at artifacts, which we did April 8th, if you start with your artifacts, then you get things like this and you use your artifacts to build your mouth projects. This whole thing is scaffolded for you. I've made this building blocks for you. This is a course. We've packed everything in very quick and very tight, but it's a course. Now, ha! that is what I wanted to show you today. Um, we didn't actually have you go into breakouts to fill out the Mekong checklist. Um, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second because I need to breathe. Um, uh, you can use the checklist, although I just did it orally and kind of encourage you to do it uh, in the chat. You can use the checklist to analyze the Mekong and that gives you practice because the absence chart we did as a larger group. OK, so you can do that. Use the checklist and fill out the Mekong in each section. We're not gonna do that, but I did it a little bit orally so you get the idea, okay? Now, now that we are at this point where I'm hoping that you get what MELP is and the survey project, which is Martha and Mekong. Just remember that, two examples, two very different examples, okay? And you see the low level that I'm talking about. We're not talking about high level proficiency here. You, you can't really say, oh, MALP doesn't work. My students are too low proficient. No, no, no. You saw what we had here. Okay. Now, the next thing I'd like you to learn about for MALP is theme booklets. So we have very little time, but what I want to do is show you and get you motivated to look at videos number four and five. So I'm going to show you some, just a peek at what you're going to learn is the next project is a theme book. 
I'm going to quickly show you what I mean by theme booklets. And you can make these on anything. Theme booklets can be on language. Can you tell what this theme booklet is about? This is an electronic booklet made on PowerPoint by each student made their own. That's not his real name, by the way. OK, so this guy made his. This is his project. Can you tell what they were teaching? What was, the, what was being taught there? And he made his own. They each made their own. What is he doing? What is he working on? OK, and then this one was a social study. That was a language class. This is social studies class. And I'll show you what they were working on in a minute. And then this was um, second grade. So I'm going to show you real quick. So you're going to see, I am going to talk about these. Oh, that's so cool. I want to do it again. Woo! I love that. Anyway, he built that in. He did that. OK. But you're going to see this on video number four. I talk all about this guy and what he did. See, this is what he did. This is just a tiny piece of him. I show you the whole thing. And we talk a lot about it and why it was a mouth project. We talk about that. That's his. This is this is I'm going very fast, very fast. This is Carol. Look at the look at on the left. What do you see? You see what it is. All right. So what did Carol do? And again, this will be in video number four. She did this. She taught about the Venn diagram, but familiar language and content. Here is the web quest. She taught them about web quests, but not with Abraham Lincoln. It was a civil war uh, unit. She had them research, and they, this guy was indigenous, uh, Kiche, you know them, Tekunoman, and that was the hero of his country. He did a web quest. So this is social studies, all right? And you'll learn about it in the video. This is Renee. She did the welcome book at the second grade. They each made a cover, shared responsibility, individual accountability, everything's there. This is sharpen your pencil on the left. You know, this is second grade. She's teaching sequencing, first, next, then, last, right? But they made these welcome books. They had a big stack of them. And any new person came and picked the one they wanted to pick. And the kids got excited. Oh, pick mine. The only thing different was the cover. Great project, mouth project. The fifth, that's the fourth video. Watch the fourth video. It has those theme booklets, but not just the booklets, but the rationale and all the theory. Advocacy. I don't want to, I don't want to give it away. I'm just going to skip this because I'm just going to go you know, through it real, real fast. But number five is how to advocate. And I get passionate in that video, <laughs> I have to warn you. But uh, it's all about advocacy. It's about reframing the conversation. This should be our conversation. Our conversation is not about a gap in achievement. Our conversation is about cultural dissonance. You address the cultural dissonance, you use mouth, and you'll see that gap, so-called achievement gap. It will shrink. It will shrink. I guarantee you. I've seen it. I've done it. OK, so this is another very important slide to show administrators. I'm not going to go through it with you because our time does not permit, but you can look at it. It's a very important go to slide showing what it looks like to talk about cultural dissonance and not the achievement gap. It's a visual that explains the slide previous important slide for administrators. And then this is a poem from my student. I think it's in one of the videos, but I always like to show it anyway. After three years with me and with Mal, he really got it. He made the transition. This is the same student that I mentioned in one of the videos who said, uh, I, learned, I learned notebooks and pens make us know how to live here in the literacy section when I talked about literacy. And this is his poem. I invite you now, and this is, I'm going to wind it up. This is it. This is the payback here. Join me. Come to Perusal. You come to perusal.com. This is your code. Enter this code, Marshall K77UE. It's a little hyphen. You join the course. I'm there. It's an ongoing asynchronous course, and I'm there. You can come and be with me, okay? You can come and be with me, and you have this in your uh, folder. So you can go to this slide and copy whatever you need. And this is the discount. If you stayed until four o'clock, you get the discount. So it's a special offer for Ergo members only. It's 40% off these three books, which all have fantastic, sorry, <laughs> well, they're my books. What can I say? And you use the code ErgoMalp21, pretty straightforward code. So I invite you to take advantage of this discount any Ergo member, 
Okay, so if you're a member, I'm not sure what that involves to be a member, but if you're a member, you get the Ergo Mouth 21 discount. You can see my email. My co-author, Andrea DiCapua, is here in spirit because she and I wrote the books together. And there's one more book that she wrote, which is an ebook, Slife, What Every Teacher Should Know. It's a quick one, very quick. Okay. And that is it. I did it. 4 p.m. Well, thanks very much, Helene. Um, I know that uh, you felt rushed, but I know that I certainly got a lot out of your presentation. Um, I'm really grateful, though, that this is not the end of our journey and that you're open to further discussion with us. Um, lots of thank yous coming into the chat now to you, Helene. I know you have another meeting right now, so I won't keep you too long, uh, but we will be in touch and the pre-work has been great to engage in. It's a little bit of a different format than I'm used to when I go to PD sessions, but you looking into the camera, I, I felt like I was in a room with you. You have a very special way of presenting to us that makes us feel that you are modeling that whole relationship piece for us when we feel like you are in the space with us. Um, I certainly appreciate your presentation style, but more so your content. Uh, thanks very much for being with us today. And again, I will be emailing you. We'll be in touch soon. Okay, and thank you all. And by the way, my meeting is not at four. I wouldn't do oh, that okay. to myself. I would never do that. I've got to, I've got to just breathe. But I, I mean, I have a meeting in a, in a little bit coming up. My next meeting is coming up. No, no, you're too important for that. I wouldn't back to back you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay. No questions coming in the chat at the moment. This, but if uh, anyone has a question, just pop it in the chat. And if I can't answer it right now, I will answer it because I'm saving the chat. I will answer all your questions. I will send an email to Karen.